Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to start in just a few minutes. We're just waiting for our attendees to join us. Thank you for your patience. We're very happy to have you all here. Wonderful. So everyone is coming on right on in. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. So before we get started, I just wanted to um, go over some webinar and community guidelines. First off, my name is Nola Wanta. I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration at LMU. So for our um, webinar for tonight, uh, just a couple of reminders to please type in your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentations. Also use the chat window to post your comments only to the panelists and to the general audience. And then just as a friendly reminder that this webinar will be recorded and will be available after the presentation. For all of our students that are joining us tonight at the very end of the presentation, we will have a QR code for CBA Advantage. So for those of you who are collecting points, please stay tuned and stay through the entire presentations to capture the QR code. And with that, next slide, please. I would like to introduce the Dean of the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University, Dean Dale Smith, who will kick us off. Dale? Great. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Paul Grush Lecture Series. It's my pleasure on behalf of the College of Business Administration here at LMU to give a great welcome to everyone. This is one of our first big community events that we're doing in addition to other activities, but it's particularly special because I also have the honor of not only knowing the speaker who will be terrific and wonderful speaking to the issues of corporate governance and uh, Rosemary Kim, Professor Kim will introduce her in a minute, but it's also a moment to honor uh, Professor Rosemary Kim who was newly named as the Paul Grosh Professor and she works in the area as a professor of accounting. So um, I don't wanna take up a lot of everyone's time, but just to remind you, this is one of those topics tonight that really is so related to our mission. The mission of advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage, creative confidence, to be a force for good in the global community. And what a great kickoff event to be speaking to something so dear and near to our mission. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Rosemary Kim, our Paul Grosh Professor in Accounting. Rosemary, over to you. Thank you, Dean Smith, for the warm welcome. I'm really honored to um, have the uh, title of Grosh Professor. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening to hear from one of our distinguished alumni, Ms. Maria Salinas. Maria, we are so grateful to have you as our guest speaker for the Grosh Lecture Series. Um, let me tell everyone a little bit about your background. Uh, Maria is a member of the class of 1987 and earned her degree in accounting. Since 2018, Maria has been the president and CEO of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce in its 132 year history. And I'm proud to say she is the first female leader. After graduating from LMU, she joined Ernst & Young while earning her CPA license. Maria then spent more than a decade as a financial executive at the Walt Disney Company and also launched her own consulting firm in finance and accounting. Over the years, Maria has held leadership roles as a board member of many organizations. It is a long, impressive list, and for the sake of time, I'll just mention a few. She serves on LMU's Board of Regents and was also the past chair. She's on the Governor's Task Force on Business and Jobs Recovery, as well as the Future of Work Commission. Maria is also the founding board member of the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. And without further ado, Maria, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kim and Dean Smith, uh, for the invitation and for being here with all of you here today. Uh, I'm so excited to be back at uh, my alma mater, 
and speaking to you about an, a topic that I think is so important uh, to those of you that are in the accounting program. And even if you're not in the accounting program, uh, when uh, I was invited to speak about uh, corporate governance and learning about Professor, Professor Paul Grosh's uh, starting this lecture series and really having this lecture series under his name, in his name, and knowing that it was about ethics in accounting and the business practices, I just feel it's such a relevant and important uh, topic that I'm so happy to be here to impart a few little nuggets uh, with you. I, I started at LMU in 1984 and I came in as a sophomore. Um, and I know that uh, Professor Grosh left in 1984, so I did not get a, a chance to meet him. Uh, but I think upon reflection, I would definitely say that uh, his work was definitely ahead of its time. But when I think of what's going on in the corporate boardroom today, and I think of all the important important work that needs to be done to bring the ethics into business practices and, and the, the history that we have seen in business. Uh, I just know that, that he started very much, very important work here at Loyola Marymount. Uh, to me, ethics are the integral to the accounting profession. Uh, and they're integral to the work that needs to be done in, at corporate America, in the business world, in the boardroom. And I think that much like you hear that healthcare professionals are at the front lines of this pandemic that we're dealing with right now, when I think of the accounting profession, I think of that profession at the front lines of corporate governance. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through a little journey that is from my seat of my view of what corporate governance is all about and uh, give you a little, a little insight on that. And we're definitely going to be leaving time at the end for a Q&A. So I really hope to engage in more conversation uh, about this important topic. So maybe we can go on to my first slide. And um, Again, just wanted to share a little bit about who I am. I am a graduate from LMU in the accounting department. I had my bachelor's of science in accounting from here. Uh, I am a CPA as well. I still have my license some 30 years later. Leaving LMU, I went into uh, accounting professional services. I worked for Kenneth Leventhal and Company and then for Ernst & Young, which today is EY. Uh, as was mentioned, I spent well over a decade in the finance organization of the Walt Disney Company and definitely got to see the intersection of, of much of what we'll be talking about today. Um, I left to start my own business. And in that business, um, I used my whole background of finance and accounting uh, to work with clients on controls and compliance work. Um, much of the foundation of what it is to be an accounting professional. And over the years of my career, I have served on numerous uh, nonprofit boards. I've had the pleasure of serving on the corporate board of a community bank here in Los Angeles that actually had to start, that actually had to survive the recession of uh, 2008 and uh, where I ultimately became the chairwoman of that bank and went on to um, uh, go through a sale of that bank. So definitely want to draw on some, some of that experience. So with that, I wanna share with you to start the conversation is why should you care about corporate service, uh, corporate board service? And, um, one of the things that I wanted to share with all of you is that when I left Loyola Marymount, I don't know that I ever thought my career would have taken the path that it has, but it is really the foundation of my accounting experience, my knowledge that I was gained here, the values that were instilled here that aligned so nicely with corporate board service. When I think of going into the boardroom, 
and really having a foundational knowledge, not only on the accounting and the finance uh, area, but also the values, the ethics that need to be in the boardroom around accountability, around um, ensuring that there's good oversight and, and that there's good processes. A lot of those things were things that I learned here at Loyola Marymount. So as you go through your career here at LMU, I want you to think about what corporate board service might mean in your long-term professional career. So with that, let's get started into my next slide here. What I wanna cover in today's conversation is first defining corporate governance and what does that mean? I wanna share with you a little bit about the attitudes and the evolution of corporate governance. And I'm going to specifically reference just its evolution in the attitudes about the corporate boardroom, just even within the last year, because definitely things have changed. And then for today, you know, what is the boardroom like today? What is corporate governance mean today? And how does that relate back to you and what you're doing? So let's go on to the next slide. For me, when I think of corporate board governance, I think of the highest level of decision-making. In a corporation, there are thousands of employees. There's executives that are often called the C-suite, the CEO, the CFO, um, all with goals and plans on how to execute on the mission of that organization. And it's the board that sets that strategy. So when you think of a corporation and you think of uh, thousands of employees, uh, global operations, think about this, a board of governance for such a corporation may consist of less than 20 individuals. The Walt Disney Company has 10 corporate board members. Bank of America has 17. Home Depot has 12. So when you put that into perspective in terms of the size of the organization, you realize that there is a lot of power and a lot of influence in a corporate boardroom that may be just a handful of individuals. And so certainly the expertise that is sitting around that table comes into play as something that's very important. So what does that roles and responsibility mean? And I'll take you to the next slide. When we think of board responsibilities, so the board of directors are the outside individuals that oversee the strategic direction of a corporation. They're responsible for the fiscal oversight, making sure they understand the financial statements, the controls and compliance uh, work related to that. They have oversight responsibility for the chief executive officer. And it's their responsibility to act in the best interest of the institution. So that means that if you're in the boardroom, you're there not as Maria Salinas, you know, president of the chamber, you're there as Maria Salinas, the indiv individual that has the legal oversight over the institution that I may be sitting on for, for that board seat. Board members have something that's commonly referred to as a duty of care and a duty of loyalty. And oftentimes you'll hear the word fiduciary duties. And that's basically what I have on this slide, some of the basic core fiduciary, fiduciary duties that board members have. Let's go on to the next slide. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an example of what some of those board responsibilities might be. Because I can tell you that over my years of experience, I've sat on boards and some that have been very small, uh, where sometimes there's been a bit of a gray area and we start talking about things that we shouldn't be talking about. And this is what I mean. 
if you look at the green box that I have on this calendar, uh, on this schedule here, um, what are some of those responsibilities? Understanding, developing, um, ensuring that the strategic plan is uh, for, for the business, is something that is achievable, that it's got good metrics, that it's something that um, you, has that it has good me measurement um, of performance related to it. Those are things that are important for a board to have as uh, within their responsibility area. Typically, when we talk about oversight for the chief executive, we're talking about the ability to hire the CEO of a corporation, and if an exit needs to happen, the board is the one responsible for that. Other examples of responsibilities could include succession planning, succession planning for the chief executive. It could also be succession planning within the, the board context itself. How do we bring on new board members? Uh, it definitely includes review of financial statements, understanding the financials, the investments, um, all the fiscal items of the organizations, that's a responsibility of a board of directors and part of cor corporate governance. Understanding the controls and the compliance, uh, everything from you know, the implementation of controls, the execution of audit reports and things of that nature, all of that is a responsibility of the board. And I think it's important to recognize that there are certain things that a board of director is not responsible for. It's not responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, for staff meetings, for operational decisions, even for things related to the organizational structure. All of those things are the responsibility of the CEO of the organization. And it's the board's responsibility to make sure that they hire a CEO that has the competencies to be able to handle all the operational items uh, related to an organization. So, so you always wanna stay within the, within the green box when it comes to good corporate governance. Uh, anything outside of that or that is even uh, operational in nature um, is not where we want good corporate uh, boards to be at. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to take you through a little bit of what corporate governance has looked like over the years. You know, from my seat, from my perspective, what I've, what I've seen. And I mentioned right at the beginning that there has been an evolution and some changes that have even happened within the last year. But when I left Loyola Marymount, when I went into the real world and started working at my accounting firm, you know, I worked on audit clients, I worked within an industry that definitely placed value on shareholders. So when we looked at you know, uh, the financials of a company, when we looked at how management teams operated within a company, when we looked at the board structure, the, the, the one thing that was always to be kept in mind was shareholder value. So if you were at a company, the most important thing was everything related to the stockholders, everything related to the shareholders. And so when you think about corporate governance for many years, at least for within the very recent years, it's all been about shareholder value. And that means that the shareholder, who's the owner of that company, that the decision-making that's done is all about ensuring that they retain some form of value, that the decisions are made in the best interest of shareholders. So for many years, that, that was the common understanding. And I think even today, you might hear some uh, companies speak about that, but I really wanna walk you through how that has changed over the last couple of years. Now, many of you might remember, might not remember in the, 
early 2000s, there was something called the dot-com bubble. And it was when many companies, uh, dot-com companies, it's going to be a tongue twister for me, uh, started up and uh, were gaining value right away, even though they didn't have real earnings. And there were so many companies that um, were started out this way that um, it, it was inevitable that there was going to be a bust. And it did happen. Um, and you saw, we were just talking right before we came on this, this uh, program here, that, that you saw so many investors lose out on their value, lose their money, uh, because they had invested in these dot-com companies that were essentially overvalued. Um, and that, that resulted, that along with several accounting scandals that kind of happened around the same time, there, there is one famous case, a company called Enron, that um, where there was really a lot of, you know, pointing fingers between the CEO, the CFO, the external auditors, and it just really turned into a very bad situation that the company ended up going under. And it just led to many hearings in Congress. And what resulted from that, along with this dot-com dot com bubble that burst, was uh, Congress passed an act called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. And in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is known as SOX, it really outlined some of the control and compliance uh, procedures that needed to be in place in the accounting world of these major corporations. It was the first time that corporate governance was really pointed to as an area that needed to be addressed in terms of acknowledgement that the CEO, the CFO had responsibility for the fiscal matters of an organization. So Sarbanes-Oxley really changed the way um, businesses worked, even with their accountants. Um, I was at Walt Disney, at the Walt Disney Company during that time. And uh, when we were trying to figure out how to implement the various rules uh, related to Sarbanes-Oxley, we worked very closely with our external auditors. And all of a sudden, it was almost like we had to uh, there was a there was a great effort, um, not a great effort. There was great um, a great focus placed on the independence rules that accountants had. Um, so all of a sudden, when we had a very cozy relationship with our accountants, we had to basically, um, you know, walk in def different different halls almost. At the Walt Disney Company, uh, the floor that I was on, we shared office space with our external auditors that were on site almost year round. And uh, they, they ended up having to move out of our building because it was just viewed as, you know, you wanted to keep the highest level of independence. So it was definitely a real change from a corporate governance perspective. Because all of a sudden in the boardroom, you became aware of all these rules that needed to be put in place to ensure that there was the highest level of ethics within an organization that even relayed to, the, to how we had a relationship with the external auditors uh, of a company. Um, so that was definitely uh, a time period that for me, great learnings. Um, during that, uh, after that, uh, you can imagine that we, a lot of times we talk about the Great Recession of what happened in 2008. And I often think of my career as having the learnings just based on the economics of what was going on. You know, the highs and the lows, you know, definitely contributed to the experience that I have. Uh, but during the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, uh, I was on the board of a community bank. And 
certainly within that boardroom, we had one of the most complex timeframes of really trying to get to how are we going to survive the recession? How are we going to grow a financial institution that was new, that um, had only been around for two years, and had put together a business plan that was outdated, essentially, uh, because the economy around us uh, was just folding, especially in the financial services markets. Um, that uh, really, we were placed under great scrutiny by the regulators. Banks are regulated uh, by the uh, FDIC, as well as the state of California. And so what that meant is that during that period of time, um, we had to report on a very regular basis to our regulators. Now, remember, I had been an auditor before. I had worked at Ernst & Young. I had worked at the Walt Disney Company. And I had all this experience. And when I was asked, the board asked me if I would chair the compliance committee so that I could work directly with the regulators. I thought, sure, I have the background for that. I know exactly what to do. Uh, and that was a, a rude awakening for me because I learned that uh, the regulators are uh, very different than auditors, that they have a strict interpretation of the compliance requirements, and they have an expectation that those folks that are sitting around the boardroom understand every aspect of the, um, of the financial, uh, of the legal, structure of that bank or that organization. Um, so it was definitely a period of time that, you know, there was great stress in the boardroom. There was only um, nine board members. And you can imagine the burden that was felt within that boardroom during that period of time when we weren't sure if the bank was going to be able to weather the storm. And uh, with so much scrutiny, uh, we had to be very careful in our transparency, our accountability, and ensuring that we were very well prepared when we went into meetings with the regulators, whether it was the federal government or the state of California. Um, and that's where I learned the importance about, you know, being prepared, the importance of making sure that um, we're transparent, with our regulators that, that if something doesn't look right and isn't right, that we own it and we learn how to, we talk about how to address it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that we weathered that storm and we were able to move into a growth mode uh, once we came out of that recession. Uh, but that, that period of time for me was about uh, uh, the length of about seven or eight years of just a, a level of intensity like I've never known before. I think the boardroom after that period really recognized the importance of community, the importance of corporate social responsibility. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide to touch upon this a little bit because I think the boardroom did learn that you know, with so much going on in the economy and ensuring that you know, there was good fiscal oversight, that there's still more. There's more that a company can do. You know, so when we think about corporate social responsibility, we think of it as like a credo of, you know, the social conscience of an organization. And you all know that there are companies that, you know, do social good, whether it's in the environment or other humanitarian efforts. That comes under an umbrella that's known as CSR which is the corporate social responsibility. I think a lot of that came out of that recession when uh, companies were really looking to broaden themselves and, and do more. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And again, these are just brands that you probably recognize that have some sort of social uh, conscience to the work that they do. 
they're out, uh, you know, doing good work in their business, but they also have a sense of giving back. So let's go to the next slide. So again, so there's definitely been a movement around corporate social responsibility. And I wanted to talk in particular about something that changed over the last year. Last year, the uh, Business Roundtable, there is an organization called the Business Roundtable, which convenes all the CEOs of the major corporations. What they did is they revised what is known as the purpose of a corporation. So let's go to the next slide. So remember how earlier I was talking about the primary goal around um, the role of a company, of a corporation with shareholder value? And certainly the many years that I worked in uh, business, it was always about shareholder value. Well, last year, this group redefined the purpose of a corporation. And it went from being all about shareholder value to, being, to expanding that into these areas. It was expanding it to be value to customers. So that means you think about your customers as well in terms of that value equation. It's about employees, investing in employees. It's about dealing fairly with suppliers. So really understanding who is part of the supplier network, the people that you purchase from, that a corporation purchases from, and understanding that they have a well-being and that they have a role to play in, in the corporate structure. It's about supporting communities like the CSR program that I mentioned. And in the end, it, that will all lead to long-term value for shareholders. So that's how you saw the corporate purpose go from shareholder value only expanding it to include customers, employees, suppliers, and communities. So let me take you to another slide that I have here to just give you an example of this. So the business roundtable, this is uh, Delta Airlines CEO, Ed Bastian. He actually penned a, a piece where he talked about corporate purpose and putting people before profits. Unheard of unheard of. Uh, but that is essentially the mood in corporate America right now. Uh, Home Depot, uh, I actually got a chance to visit Home Depot in Atlanta. They're headquartered there. And uh, they uh, make reference to this inverted pyramid that they have, that they put their customers first, their frontline associates first, their field support, their corporate uh, support, and the CEO is at the bottom. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't mean at the bottom, but it just goes to show you the shift that many of these major corporations are going through as they see the type of divide that exists in this, in, in this economy that we have. So let's move on to the next slide. So pivoting from that conversation about where companies have gone um, and how they've evolved in their corporate governance, there's one thing that I wanted to mention and talk about, and that's the corporate board diversity angle. And diversity is one piece. What I don't have on this slide, which, um, which I should make, should make sure that I have it, but I want to make sure I talk about it is the whole conversation not only around uh, diversity in the boardroom, but inclusion and equity. And I think those are conversations that many corporations were already having, but with the unrest that we saw earlier this year, with the pandemic giving light to so many disparities that exist in our society, you saw many companies come out with statements statements of how they want to tackle their inequities within their or organizations, within their communities. In California, you should know that there were two laws that were passed very recently that um, 
addressed board diversity. One was a law to expand um, board seats to include women on boards. And that was passed in 2018. Just this past year, the governor signed into law uh, about two months ago, uh, a new law that would expand uh, board representation to include minorities and other underrepresented uh, people on the boards of California headquartered companies. This is a major shift in California and not anything that you see across the country. But I can tell you that from the many meetings that I participate in, um, you know, in other parts of the country or on various national boards that I sit on, that people are looking at California and seeing the progressive activity that is going on in the corporate boardroom around governance. And it's something that, it, that we should be proud of because um, it really is a model for other companies um, to try to follow suit that may not be headquartered here. Now, I already mentioned to you that the boardroom could be a small group of people, and it's the highest form of decision-making. So it's, in my view, it is so important that we have a, a, a representation of our, of our community, of our country that is being served by that company, that that, that that board reflects that type of diversity. So why am I sharing all of this with you? We picked this topic because I think this topic is right in line with what you learn here at Loyola Marymount, the values of the institution and if we can go to my next slide, I think it's probably my last slide. But when I looked at LMU's mission, and just, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of LMU, so I don't need to read these words. Um, but what I learned here at Loyola Marymount, what has stuck with me is, you know, the fact that, you know, the ethics are so important going into the business world, that having a voice and ensuring that we are promoting justice, whether it's a small community bank board, whether it's on the governor's task force, that we're thinking about inclusion of, you know, those that might not have a voice. You know, I think LMU is so well positioned to be training the leaders and building that pipeline of the future leaders that need to be sitting on the boards that I need representation from, from everyone in our community here. So I leave you with that thought that, you know, I hope you consider board service as part of your own career planning. I think the accounting pro profession is so well suited um, because it aligns very much with the responsibilities that a board member uh, needs to have. So with that, I believe that's my last slide, but let's see, is there another slide that I have after here? Q&A. <laughs> so Professor Kim, I will pass it to you and uh, let you uh, take it from here. Thank you so much, Maria. That was such a great talk about all the importance of board members and social responsibility and my students who are taking notes, I know they have ample amount of great stuff that they've uh, put on their notes. So thank you so much. We do have some questions here and there are some coming in. So I will do my very best to um, address all the questions as they come in. Uh, the first question is, um, what are the incentives to investors if profits are not the main objective of a corporation. Yeah, I think uh, I, that's a great question. And I think if you look at what's going on in the stock, stock market, right? If you look at investors, uh, for example, uh, if you look at BlackRock, where their own CEO um, has made calls to corporate America 
that uh, there should be a greater inclusion, that there should be greater commitments to community. Um, I think you have to take those cues from those type of investors to know that um, it isn't that you're ignoring shareholder value, is that you're expanding the role that other elements that a corporation impacts that you're recognizing that they're your constituents as well. So let me give you an example. Um, in the suppliers, we talked about suppliers. Uh, a corporation like where I worked at the Walt Disney Company, we purchased from thousands of suppliers from around the world. We needed to be conscious and aware of who they are and how we treated them and what types of policies we wanted to have in place uh, not so we could just take from them, but that we were also giving to them. So I, I think that if you were to look at the investor community, I think there's definitely a move in going broader versus, versus more um, you know, specific to just shareholders. Great, thank you. Um, this next person has asked a few questions, so I'm gonna uh, break it down for you. First is what type of experience are, um, are companies looking for in their potential board membership? What kinds of experience does one have to have and such? And then secondly, how can a person who might be interested in serving as a board find opportunities? And then I'll ask you the next one later. So if you want to address those two. So the first one was about what type of experience? Yes. And then the, how do you find those opportunities? Absolutely. So um, remember what I said about the responsibilities, right? The responsibilities are around the fiscal oversight, strategic plan. So one of the things that is really sort of fundamental in experience is really the financial experience. Understanding how to read a financial statement. So that's why I'm excited about this group because you are all working on that, most of you, I think, <laughs> are in that space, understanding the accounting, uh, you know, the business, the economics, definitely that type of experience base is going to serve you well. I got more calls about board service because Maria, you've been a CPA. Maria, you understand how to read financial statements. That's core, that's fundamental. So I think that regardless of your career path, don't forget that, you know, that accounting and finance is going to serve you well if you were to seek out a board position. How do you find one? That's where you really need to, what I would suggest is graduating from LMU, you know, getting your experience, becoming an expert in your field, whether it's, you know, you stay in professional services or you do something else, but just come becoming an expert in what you do. And then building your relationships, building your network so that you let people know what your interests are. I would recommend serving on a nonprofit board. My first board service came two years after uh, graduating from LMU, I went out and got involved with a couple of uh, community groups. And uh, then I was uh, recommended to the Girl Scout board of Los Angeles. That's the first board that I sat on. And through that board, I met other people that were much senior to me and took me under their wing and recommended me to the next board service after that. So that by the time I got invited to join the corporate board, I had years of experience of governance, even though it was in the nonprofit sector, which is very valuable. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the third part of the question is, if somebody is actually interested in serving, uh, what could one do to prepare himself, herself? to be more qualified? Are, is there any kind of training or schools that can give you more insight on how to do this? Yes, there, there are definitely training programs available. Some of the universities have training programs. 
um, some, and they, and they could be, um, they're, they're typically called director programs. So I took, a, I took a director's college program while I was serving on the board. Because I, I, you, can, you can always you know, learn more and, uh, about these topics um, at Stanford University. So I went for a weekend and did a, a three-day training program. But you can find those. You can find there's several nonprofits that have uh, training programs so that even if you're not in, if you don't have a finance background, you can still be, um, you know, uh, there are still programs so that you get the fundamentals and the basics of how to serve. So yes, there's definitely resources, especially now, because I think there's a big move to ensure that we have um, a good pipeline for the future. I see. Thank you. Uh, Maria, how would you compare your company's situation during the recession in 2008 to the pandemic that current small businesses are facing today? Well, I think I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> um, I think it's different. Um, you know, when, when, I, uh, when I was on the bank board and I was sharing about 2008, it was something that, that happened over a period of time. It was something that we could see coming, that every quarter, you know, there was a drop in earnings and a drop in earnings. Um, when this uh, health crisis was named a pandemic, I remember that day and reflecting and thinking, is this like 2008 or is this different? And I immediately felt that this was different, that we needed to move swiftly because if the economy was going to shut down, it was going to shut down like within the next week, not within the next year. And because of that, um, I felt, especially at the chamber, that our small businesses were going to be in such great pain because small businesses don't have the big infrastructure that major corporations do where they, they know, you know how to go to plan B if something happens. Small businesses don't have that. They don't have that type of safety net. So we quickly uh, moved into almost like a response mode uh, of providing resources, of getting information, of advocating for uh, resources from the federal government. Uh, we were talking to legislators before the whole um, uh, the CARES package uh, came out. Uh, when it finally did come out, uh, we were the first ones, one of the first ones to say, hey, this is not enough. And it needs to also go down to the very micro businesses that do work here in Los Angeles. So I think it's very different. I think it's a quick, it was a quick shutdown and we're still waiting to see what reopening is going to look like. And um, it's definitely a different, different uh, mood within our, our circles. Thank you. Um, one person wants to ask, um, why, why does California have a law that opens up board opportunities for women and minorities? Wouldn't boards ideally be made up of those who are most qualified for such a position? Well, you would think, uh, but uh, I just, I'll just give you my, my experience. I've, uh, I served on a bank board for 14 years, um, four of those years, uh, I was the only woman on the, on the uh, board. Um, so you would think that that is a common place, but it's, it, it's something that, you know, is not, um, you know, sometimes when a board comes together, you know, it is um, who you know right? So it could be your friend, it could be your, a colleague of some kind. So it's a very close-knit group. So we need to recognize that. So how do you break into that if that's not within your normal circles? 
And I think that's what California legislators were trying to do. In 2014, I believe it was, I was invited to speak to the state senators during one of their um, planning sessions. And I was asked to sit on a panel about women in the C-suite, women in the boardroom. And the, um, the moderator was Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, who's actually the author of the, the law related to women. And I remember asking her, she's like, I want you to talk about the corporate board piece, Maria, and how we need more women in the boardroom. And right now, California has a resolution. And the resolution says that companies that are headquartered here should have women on their board. And I remember just asking her, what if they don't? And she says, we've been waiting for a long time. And if companies don't bring women onto their boards, we're gonna have to pass a law. <laughs> and I remember that when she said that, she was just so definitive in her words that about a year later, when I heard that she was introducing that, I remember thinking that law is going to pass. That law is going to pass because, you know, there was such conviction in her words. And there had been so many years that um, this resolution was out there encouraging companies to do that. And yet uh, women are, you know, in the, you know, percent, single digit percents. And for women of color, it's even worse uh, in terms of the number that are represented. And so this past year, the new law that was introduced was to expand uh, board representation uh, to people of color and, and other underrepresented uh, categories. And, and the governor signed that law on August 31st. Thank you. Um, we probably have um, time for a few more questions. And so um, one is, is there anything else you feel still needs to be done to promote CSR and um, ethical inclusive business practices? Yeah, you know what we need to do with those type of programs is um, just make sure that they're not a program, that they're embedded into the culture of the organization. You know, one of the things that came out of the Sarbanes-Oxley rules was the tone at the top. And I really believe in that. I really believe that organizations, companies that have a good tone at the top and the top is from the board to the CEO to on down within, within the organization. So that anything related to CSR is authentic. It has to be authentic. You know, and if there's really to any value to be gained, it's because there's a level of authenticity to everything that the company does. All you have to do is take a look back at just a couple of months ago, all the companies that were issuing statements about inclusion and diversity. Some of those got challenged by their customers, by their suppliers and saying, what does your board look like? <laughs> And so it has to be authentic. I think, you know, what still needs to happen is that that needs to be embedded into the culture of the organization. Thank you very much. Um, one question I see here is, um, this is similar to a question I asked uh, a little while ago that you answered, but I want to ask it just uh, to get another perspective. Um, while there is a shift towards CSR and ethics, Ethic, um, ethical priorities in corporations, do you still think there's an obligation for corporations to make profits because they have to make profits in order to best serve their communities? So how do they balance that? I, you know, I think it's, I, you're right. I think it is very similar to, to the question um, that was asked earlier. And I think one of the things that, uh, we hear a lot and we work with, um, you know, we always talk about, you know, that businesses, you know, can be strong. And if businesses are strong, communities can be strong. And it's kind of like what Dale, uh, what um, 
Dean, Dean Smith uh, mentioned where she talks about business being a force for good. You know, there is, um, there, I, I don't view it like you have one or the other. They're mutually beneficial, you know? And if, and if an organization does it right, where they're looking at all their constituents and they're considering um, everything that uh, their employees, uh, their communities, their, su their suppliers, where they bring that all to the table, they're successful. And people want to, you know, gravitate, to, want to go work for them, want to, you know, engage with them in business, want to be their customers. So, so we look at it um, in, a, in a variety of forms to always, you know, go back to the fact that, you know, a strong business can mean a strong community. Wonderful, thank you. And I think this might be definitely a student asking, but um, they wanna know for future board members out there, what are some words of wisdom that you can give them? Okay, you all have to be future board members because we need, um, we need to expand the pipeline. Um, and I believe that at a, a school like LMU, uh, an experience uh, like the one that you get with the Jesuit Marymount traditions, that those values, those values will stay with you forever. They have for me. And, um, you know, I don't get a chance to visit that, the university that often, but when I do, it's, it's just such a great feeling of being there on campus. And I think that, you know, my recommendation would be, you know, start small, start, you know, thinking about those nonprofits that you're really passionate about and jump right in and learn. And don't be afraid to take something on that you don't know. I was afraid to take on the chairmanship of the board and I would have never put myself out there, but it was my fellow colleagues that said, you're gonna be the, the next board chair. I've been the chair of the audit committee, of the governance committee. Those are things I never would have thought I would have done. And it was somebody that was there mentoring me and saying, you, you should do this. So believe in yourself because I think when you take on things that are new, you learn so much and um, that will be with you for the rest of your career. Wow, thank you very much. Um, some of uh, the other students that have posted wanted, wanted to, some um, advice from you basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of steps away from corporate governance and I hope that's okay with you. Sure. But uh, they wanted to ask you if you um, can just share your experience working for a large accounting firm. What was it like? And how did that transcend to you owning your own consulting firm? And just what was it like for you in your first, let's say several years uh, of career? Yeah, I mean, thank you for taking me back there. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm an Angelino, born and raised here. I never thought I would end up at a university like Loyola Marymount. My parents, you know, um, I'm a first gen student. They didn't quite know the system. So they didn't also, uh, I always call myself a first professional as well. I'm the first in my family to have a professional career. You know, everyone else in my family worked in, you know, automotive or out in the fields or some, some a factory. Uh, so for me, there was so much newness in going to work. My first firm, I worked in uh, Century City. So I had an office in Century City for about four years uh, before I moved downtown to Ernst & Young. And, you know, it was... Um, Back then, so this was in the late 80s, uh, not too many women in the field. Uh, I was the only Latina professional, and that was definitely something that weighed on me uh, because I was trying to navigate a field that, um, you know, was new in so many ways. But one of the things that, um, that happened to me was being different 
in that environment almost uh, fueled me to be stronger and to work hard and to really learn. And I pushed myself to, you know, get involved with things that maybe I wouldn't have, maybe to take a, you know, get on a client that was a little more technical that I really didn't under understand their industry uh, and just push myself in those ways. And I think I've always had that in me to want to succeed, to maybe prove that I belong there. Uh, that I think was certainly part of it. And uh, it was very helpful. Um, I made the decision to go to the Walt Disney Company um, because I felt that that would really round out my experience. You know, I had eight years in public accounting. I had my CPA. Um, I had been a manager. And so going inside uh, the finance organization of a major corporation like that sort of rounded out my experience. And I walked in there. Um, really having a solid background in accounting and was able to move into the financial reporting department and learn all this about external reporting, about how investors come into play, about how decisions are made, um, you know, from the finance perspective that impact a company. And, and I ended up being there for about 11 years. And I left because I had small children at the time. And I thought I need to take a bit of a back seat. And uh, so I stepped out of the workforce, uh, but I thought I'm gonna start my business to do some consulting because I felt I had all this experience. And I ended up getting um, work with some major corporations. So I ended up hiring a small team and we did a lot of you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, controls and compliance work, audit support. Um, one of my clients was Toyota Motor Sales. So, you know, I got all this great experience. Um, I've definitely taken some risks and I realized that, you know, uh, uh, it's taken me a long time to muster up the energy <laughs> to actually go through it. So I think it took me probably about a whole year before I actually decided, okay, I'm leaving Disney and I'm gonna start a small business. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, I think that uh, I look at my experience in a very holistic way. And I think if I were talking to my 20 year old self, I would probably say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid and go for it. <laughs> Wonderful, that's such wise words. Thank you so much. And I know it's uh, past seven and uh, I want to respect everyone's time and especially Maria's time because I'm sure you've had a long day. And uh, thank you so much for such a great talk. I think our students got so much out of it, all our attendees, and I know I certainly did. So thank you so much. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to have been here. Thank you so much. Thank you.